been able to or been asked to talk about the moral hall takeover in this context in different settings and to different audiences. Um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll try to, to focus on what I, I think are some of the kind of questions, concerns that this audience might have. I was a student here, an undergraduate student from 1963 to 1968. And those years uh, were years of, uh, of tremendous excitement and hope on the part of the student uh, cohort I was part of. And there were also years of tremendous turbulence and political chaos. All right? The fall semester of my freshman year, John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. In, the, in February of 1965, in my junior year, Malcolm X was assassinated in uh, New York City. In, as we know, 19, spring of 1968, my year I graduated as a senior, uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated. Between those years, we experienced uh, a succession of what uh, were called long, hot summers, major urban rebellions in African-American communities that far exceeded the capacity of local police forces to address and required the U.S. Army and the National Guard to deal with. And they, again, they spanned the country. They ultimately led to the creation of a presidential commission, the Kerner Commission, whose report came out in 1967 and said that we had uh, created two separate societies, uh, white and black and unequal and that the uh, current round of civil disorders were part of a cycle that went back to the First World War, were in fact the third major cycle of national urban uh, civil disorders centered on race, again, going back to the post-World War I era. We were also, of course, engaged in an expanding war in Vietnam, and because we still then had a selective service draft, all young men, college men, of uh, of uh, adult age were subject to that draft. All these forces combined, of course, with the uh, ongoing civil rights movement and the crisis that it had entered, 1967, 1966 and 1967, as some of the limitations and failures of the civil rights movement became more apparent, again, in the wake of the 1963 March on Washington. As a new generation of young college-educated black students began articulating the, uh, the, the call for black power and for um, replacing the, the ministry of Dr. Martin Luther King and his associates, the ministry and the quest for a beloved community, with uh, realpolitik in the university and uh, the broader, broader, broader institutional context. And uh, that all was part of the, the backdrop of what happened here on campus in terms of the Moral Hall takeover. The immediate stimulus for it was the assassination of Dr. King on April 4th of, uh, of 1968, uh, which took place on a Friday uh, afternoon. I and some of my associates from the Afro-American National Committee were on the West Bank, and the old Sergeant Prestons at Seven Corners, when the national news came over that Dr. King had been assassinated. Over the course of that weekend, over 100 American cities were in flames. Massive civil disorders swung up, and again, the U.S. Army and the National Guard had to be called out to try to address the circumstances. I was a member of what then was, uh, had become the Afro-American National Committee, which was a new name for the black student organization on campus that had preceded it. It was called Students for Racial Progress, nicknamed STRAP, and it had been closely tied, in many ways, to the tactics and outlooks, again, of the uh, the civil rights movement under the leadership of Dr. King. We had changed the name from, the, from STRAP, Students for Racial Progress, to the Afro-American National Committee in part in response to the shift in outlook, philosophical and strategic, that marked again the transition from civil rights to black power. And Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam and the groups that would soon become the Black, uh, the, the black Panthers and so forth were part of a whole spectrum of radical new African-American organizations that in many ways repudiated the older nonviolent civil disobedience pacifist orientation that Dr. King represented. 
uh, we, we had chosen the Afro-American Action Committee in that spirit. Uh, we were, like most uh, of our peers at the time, caught up in the, both the ideological and the pragmatic battles over these different approaches, the different views of history, and so forth. And we had changed our name again to the Afro-American Action Committee. We decided, after some uh, uh, dis intense discussion over that weekend, following Dr. King's assassination, that we sh should make a decision about what response we might provide that would honor Dr. King's philosophy and outlook, however much we might disagree with some of his strategic and tactical um, stances. And in that context, uh, I was asked to draft uh, a set of demands that we then submitted to then President Malcolm Moose. And those seven demands, again, uh, were sent to um, President Moose's office that uh, week following the assassination. The university did what universities characteristically do, which is to create a task force to study <laughs> the scenario. And the task force meandered in its serpentine deliberations month after month after month through the, uh, the, the summer, through the fall, to the end of the of the, the year of 1968. And when representatives of our group finally went to meet with uh, President Moose's representatives, it was clear that the task force had made little progress indeed. Um, and we then uh, decided, again, in Dr. King's uh, spirit, to take nonviolent direct action to occupy Morrill Hall until the university uh, dealt in a, in a straightforward way with, uh, with that set of demands. The uh, demands, again, that I originally drafted, some of them were, uh, were specific and tactical. They, they called for a specific number of 200 uh, full scholarships for African-American students uh, in the state of Minnesota, at, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we called for uh, the uh, a, a review board to examine the policies of the athletic department uh, toward black athletes. Uh, we asked that the New West Bank Library, and the West Bank and was very new then, and it hadn't been named, that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's name had been, been given serious consideration for naming the New West Bank Library. Um, we asked that uh, admissions and recruitment um, uh, strategy, strategies be developed, since none had existed uh, heretofore to recruit, uh, admit, and provide financial aid for African-American students and counseling service and advising services, especially geared to the needs of black students to be created. And uh, we asked that the curriculum of the university reflect the contributions of black people to the commonwealth and culture of these United States. Uh, those are the, the uh, demands, essentially, in sum. Uh, we were told immediately, well, <laughs> there, there was immediate reaction that we were trying to destroy the university. Uh, with those demands. President Moose at the time, and he was uh, very straightforward and honest, a man of some integrity, we all acknowledge, said that to him they seemed eminently reasonable. Mm -hmm. But the negotiations had, had broken down and we occupied Morrill Hall. Out of the, the Morrill Hall occupation, um, a, a series of much, much more narrow enterprises emerged. The, uh, there was agreement to, to create a department of Afro-American and African Studies to fund a national conference of black students on this campus, um, and also to provide the support to bring uh, Muhammad Ali to campus, who then was touring the country having been stripped of his heavyweight boxing championship for refusing induction into the uh, Vietnam War in the US Army. And he was touring campuses, and we, so we brought Muhammad Ali to campus that spring. So that's the, you know, the immediate uh, you know, context for what happened. But the uh, demands themselves, several of them had been, had been stewing for a very, very long time. Um, and I, I don't want to go on at, to, at, at great length here, but our group had a, our, our student group had a wide uh, variety of, of black student uh, backgrounds. Uh, some of us, like Rosemary Freeman and Horace Huntley, who were two of our group, were ultimately indicted by the Hennepin County attorney for the takeover were from the Deep South, Mississippi and Alabama, had been involved in the civil rights protests and uh, freedom movements in the Deep South. Horace had also, was also in the U.S. Army, had come here after doing a, a term in the service and so forth. A good number of us were Minnesota born and bred. And in my own case, my uh, 
father and aunt had been students at this university back in the 1930s. My aunt was a lone black student in what was then called the School of Technology, which had ultimately become the Institute of Technology, and one of only a handful of women students who were in the School of Technology at that time. My father was a lone black student in the School of Mortuary Science. They were there as students when uh, Lotus Kaufman was president. And Lotus Kaufman um, had uh, created a policy of Jim Crow, uh, de facto Jim Crow on the university campus that barred black students from living in the dormitories, that reinforced the segregationist policies of the fraternities and sororities, that allowed the athletic department to keep black athletes from competing um, against teams, uh, primarily from the deep south, um, who uh, did not uh, 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 countenance competing against uh, black athletes on the field. So the, the gopher uh, black athletes either had to stay home or sit on the bench. Uh, there were a long list of grievances that had emerged in the 1930s. And my aunt had, in fact, become the president of the first black student organization on this campus, the Council of Negro Students, to confront President Kaufman and the deans and associates who included uh, Nicholson and Middlebrook and Coffey and the others who had uh, done so. So uh, in the times when my, my father and aunt had been here, uh, so 30 years later when I started student, there had been comparatively little, comparatively little change in the status of African Americans on this campus. So uh, in my case, and the case with a number of others in our group, uh, after in fact we had occupied Morrill Hall and we expected, fully expected them to be jailed in the process, uh, I called home, so other, other my uh, com comrades did, and notified my father that he needed to round up some bail money because I expected to be in jail, and uh, you know asked for his uh, advice and counsel, and they did not advise us not to do this. The advice was be careful. So I've uh, rambled on it uh, at some length. Uh, I can come back to in, in the Q and A to, to some of this. But uh, that's, a, I think, a fairly concrete attempt to sketch out the context in which the Morrill Hall takeover emerged, from which the Department of Afro-American Studies emerged, the creation of the Martin Luther King Jr. Counseling Advising Program in the College of Liberal Arts, and in the wake of the takeover, as David will explain here, uh, the creation of the American Indian Studies Department, the first such major department in this country, uh, two years later, the uh, formation of the Chicano Studies Program, and two years later after that, Women's Studies. So there are a variety of ripple effects from the Morrill Hall takeover that uh, dramatically changed the, uh, the culture and, uh, and I think the, uh, the sensibility of this campus. I think it would be good to, to hear a little bit more about those you know, changes that, are, that emerged afterwards from both David and Lena. Um, I certainly, we, earlier before the, the session began, we were talking about what we remembered from that day because I think you, you were both on campus as well. Um, but, but perhaps we should talk about the, 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 some of the positive things that, that flowed from the takeover of the Morrill Hall. Do you want to begin with oh. that? And then you could talk a little bit about that tonight? Sure, I, I can do that. Uh, of course, American Indian Studies started, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, in fact, we regents passed it on the same day, uh, on June 17, 1969. Uh, I don't see the Indian Studies necessarily emerging from that, but being uh, happening because of it. Let me put mm -hmm. it that way. Because I knew then that Indian Studies was developing from 1964 under old Meredith Wilson and efforts of the Bureau of Indian Affairs that were connected to uh, termination policy or the policy to, to uh, attempt to encourage self-determination and education among American Indians for the purpose that they may ultimately have to take over their own affairs after the Bureau uh, sort of disavowed the treaties, uh, stopped all the support guaranteed by the treaties, uh, for, would no longer protect the Indian lands uh, from taxes and so on and so forth. So that was a big issue to tribal people then. And it was a policy began in the 50s and it continued well up until Nixon disavowed it in 1970. So that was the umbrella of what was the principal concern of just about everybody and why we went to school. Uh, there was something called education for leadership that was the major uh, focus of what was going on. And so scholarships and other efforts were established. I uh, got a, uh, 
scholarship grant to come here for the Minnesota State Indian Scholarship Program, which was established in 1955 as a result of that whole overall policy threat. The state didn't know what to do. What are we going to do when Indians are no longer under the Bureau of Indian Affairs? And so all these things begin to happen. In fact, I was, when I was driving here, I drove by the armory building. And uh, I remember routinely visiting that building because there was a man that, in fact, I, I still remember his name because he was so important to me. He was the man that handed out my scholarship checks from the State Indian Scholarship Program. And I, his name was Vance Jewson, and I got to know that guy real well uh, because I, I needed to know him well. And I asked him once, I says, how many others here are getting tribal, federal, or state Indian scholarship grants? He says, 38 from the entire university. I didn't see many of them myself, you know. There were, were few uh, around. And, uh, and so it was just, uh, interesting to understand that at that time. You know what a full ride was in 1966 when I entered? Books, tuition, and fees were $340. <laughs> I thought it was a lot of money, to tell you the truth. A gallon of gas, a gallon of milk, and a pack of cigarettes were all the same price, around 30 cents. And uh, so, I mean, prices were different, but it was a huge opportunity to go to college at that time. And so that's how I, I got here. And so I remember that. And it's interesting, uh, I understand that, uh, a, uh, that the fall of 1966 was the beginning of the Rough Rock Demonstration School on the Navajo Reservation. But I learned that here when I was undergrad. I learned that from Roger Buffalo Head, who came here to teach uh, in Indian <coughs> Studies. And I still remember some of my first classes. And most of these classes, uh, where they're just starting, uh, had a lot of Indian students in them, I mean, relatively speaking. Of course, we were getting more and more students all the time. But I never had a professor do this before or really since. He came in and says, if everybody here was Indian, would you raise your hand? I never had anybody ask that before. And so I, I kind of looking around the room, and everybody's kind of looking around, checking each other, and saying, well, you know, are you, are you not? What's the story here? And pretty soon, everybody starts to raise their hand, sheepishly at first, you know. And pretty soon, they're all up in the air. That's, that, that was, that's more of a metaphor to me of what was really happening. People saying, yes, I am. I'm an Indian person, you know. And so that, that whole feeling was happening among the Indian community on campus that I started to get to know then. And, uh, and we all had some very interesting things in common. Uh, it was an amazing experience, which I continued into graduate school uh, from, uh, with the Indian Studies uh, was basically a, a, a program, at, what do you call it, when they, they, that I took uh, in addition to my PhD program, you know. And, uh, and so I, I took a, whole, a bunch of courses from Roger and a bunch of other people. Uh, having a, full, a person like that on campus who understood federal Indian relationship, could contextualize it for you as an Indian student, uh, and uh, while you're being educated at the same time, was really fascinating to me to do that and to be able to do that. Uh, just as the department's established, I. I was also working at the State Historical Society, and uh, I was at, had been doing that since the mid, well, about 16 years old. My mother got me the job there. But I, I was working there one day, and I was told to stay late and go get a particular box out of the museum vault, which I did. Took it to the photography section, opened it up. There was two men in that uh, area to take a picture of what was in there. Uh, I didn't know the one man, uh, but the photographer I did, a guy named Gene Becker. And I had to go through the process of taking what was about in the box out so it could be photographed. I learned, well, what I saw was a human skull and skeleton arm bone. And uh, learned in the process of that that there was Little Crow, the leader of the Sioux War in Minnesota in 1862. Uh, that transformed me as a person and as a student uh, to see that there and to ask the question, why? Now, if you can 
there was really not too many people in the university to help me do that study. But I, I did all the research on that. I learned that you could, what was interesting to me, because there was really, literally not much in the university about American Indians, and a lot was negative, is that you, didn't, you weren't necessarily dependent on it to learn the past. You just had to go find it yourself. And so I started researching, and I found every dang thing you could find about that particular incident, and I accomplished something by it. I actually accomplished, uh, ultimately, the burial of Little Crow in Flanto, South Dakota, though the state didn't want to do it. They were going to hold them for a uh, exhibition in southern Minnesota at the Lower Sioux Agency and make a tourist attraction out of it. Nonetheless, he got buried. And when I went to graduate school, my son Jim and three of my students are all Little Crow descendants, relatives. And so I was able to accomplish it. But I did that. It's interesting. I positioned myself in the middle of what I needed to know as an Indian person, and I sought the information I needed to have to do that. <coughs> Indian studies helped with that process. It helped with that because we had instructors who understood that. Uh, and, uh, and that interaction of understanding your, uh, the federal tribal relationship, understanding all of that business about your own sort of civics, your own real civics, what happened really, and knowing that, it frees you up. It positions you in the center of who you are, of who you can be, and it sets you off in a direction. Uh, the university did that. Uh, the environment that I grew up here in the University of Minnesota did that. Uh, and uh, absolutely thrilling time. Uh, and uh, I remember a lot of that whole time period. I don't know if you know much about Ada Deer, but she was working uh, at the university uh, and uh, was involved with a uh, Center for Indian Affairs out of the Training Center for Community Programs. I actually had an opportunity to work on the National Study of American Indian Education funded by the Office of Education as an undergrad in that program. And, uh, and so that was absolutely a thrilling thing to do, to give them that kind of opportunity connected to Indian education, which was really interested in to do that here. Uh, the department started off, uh, it had two language programs, uh, a Dakota language and Ojibwe language uh, program. And uh, as we understood it, the university thought it was worthwhile to do it because this was a significant cultural heritage of Minnesota, and it needed to be done. It wasn't necessarily tied to student enrollment. It was something the university had to do as a part of its mission uh, to the state to do what it could to save those languages. And uh, so I could go on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> John, about uh, the, the shift in, in, in focus and name, even, of the mm -hmm. Minister of the Rights mm -hmm. of Royal Power, and the anecdote of you raising your hands mm -hmm. uh, and, and claiming the identity. Um, and I, I should say, from the other side, just in, just in, in suggestion, of, uh, when I was in Goodson Falls, the town hall was being taken over, and we had a, a math professor who had, was there and I took about four courses from him, a wonderful guy, Bill Davis, who, who was uh, helping us learn about why those of us who saw ourselves on the left as students needed to back off from the, uh, the takeover and leave that to the African American students. I was in OCS at the time, and there was a there, there was some, there was a little bit of wrestling. It was it was a, another time when we learned yesterday went in a different direction, and. I want to hear about the formation of Tekuwa and how it understands its heritage mm -hmm. from its founding in the in the in the Six Brigade. Yes. Uh, and yes. And the, the way it's evolved over time. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, I'll be transparent about a few things. One, uh, I wasn't alive in 1968, <laughs> as many of you <laughs> probably guess. <laughs> So, so what I'm sharing 
is part of the story that's passed on within the organization and what I've been able to find in archives and in articles that have been written about the history of Hecua. Uh, but even though I wasn't there, um, that legacy is very much ingrained in the program that I ended up taking over in 2006, which was then called the Civil Rights Movement History and Consequences, and, and now is called Race in America Then and Now. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of my second and third hand knowledge about the origins of Hecua. You know, so, so in the story of the organization, um, there are two <laughs> key figures that loom large. One is a man named Joe Bash, who was a Lutheran minister who did work and, and was embedded in the community in North Minneapolis and amongst many other things, uh, did immersive youth programs for young people and for seminarians. Um, the other person who looms large is a man named Joel, uh, 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 Tors I always, I, Tors Torstenson, I always have to kind of concentrate on it, right, Joel Torstenson, who was uh, one of the <coughs> founders of the sociology department at Augsburg University, um, and uh, a real, pioneer in experiential education, you know, more broadly as well. Uh, Torstensen, um, even prior to 1968, did a lot of work around thinking through the role of colleges and universities in general in society, and in particular because Augsburg was a, you know, was a, a, um, a, a religious uh, based university kind of thinking about the connections between um, Christian level, level arts education and social change as well. Um, and um, so they both come with this history of, of work and exploration of these questions about uh, the power of, of experiential education, the power of, of not just thinking about social issues and social problems in an abstract sense, you know, but, 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 but immersing oneself uh, and learning and experiencing things and thinking through things and experience the educational process in ways that don't just involve the, the brain but the body and the spirit as well. So of course 68 comes and you've already heard you know many of the things. Thank you for that amazing context. <laughs> All right. um, what happened in 68? The story is that uh, Joe Bash was looking for people to connect with within universities and colleges in the Twin Cities. Uh, and, and fate led him to connect with Mr. Tor Tor Torstenson. <laughs> I will get his name right. And um, they joined together. Um, you know, it's Torstenson too, you know, um, was frustrated by you know, the limits of education within the walls of a university, within the walls of the classroom, you know, and, and, and really thinking through, okay, so what's the role of the university at this moment, you know, and he thought it, it certainly wasn't just here in the classroom talking about what's happening outside. So the two of them got together and came up and developed something called the crisis colony. And it ended up being a group of 18 students um, who basically had this educational experience off campus. So they were off campus, you know, different versions of the story. You know, I guess at some moment they were uh, in a synagogue and another, um, you know, other accounts they were in, um, you know, uh, um, an old Catholic, Catholic house, right? Right, so they were housed in North Minneapolis. Uh, and they had this incredible educational experience, you know, that challenged many of the, 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 the normal ways of doing things, you know, uh, in colleges and universities. Uh, for one, you know, it challenged the notion that the important things to learn are the things that you learn in a classroom. It challenged the view that the important things to learn are the things that you learn from folks who are trained to be professors, right? Many of the instructors in the program were community folks who were actually doing the work, right? And it challenged students to think about 
all right, so who am I as an actor in this world? How is my life connected to these larger social forces that are, that are at work, you know, and that are causing and driving these things that we're experiencing right now? And how do we think about our, ex our educational experiences in a way that challenges you know, the, the individualistic way that we often think about the educational experience, about personal achievement. How do we see this experience as being connected to not only our fellow students, but also the learning experiences and, and growth of our professors, of our fellow inhabitants of this city? You know, and, and because of the success of this experience, you know, this experiment, you know, it was expanded to a semester long uh, uh, program, and then eventually it became uh, the thing that birthed the creation of the Higher Education Consortium of Urban Affairs, also known as HECUA, which incorporated officially in 1971 as a nonprofit organization. Also, what happened too was, um, you know, often this type of intensive, deeply experiential education requires a lot of resources. So part of what happened between 68 and 78, uh, and, and 71 rather, as well, is that uh, uh, Torstensen uh, and Bash and, and some of the other professors um, who were involved in the crisis colony uh, decided that we wanted to build a consortium, you know, so to also connect with professors from other colleges and universities in the Twin Cities who were really deeply interested in this transformational type of education and, and again, form this consortium. Um, the crisis colony ended up becoming a program called MUST, Metropolitan Urban Studies, Metro Urban Studies term, which is now called Inequality in America. And, um, and then after that, uh, HECUA formed a, a, a wide range of programs, domestic and abroad, that that embrace the same view of education. You know, education is transformation. Education viewing the world as your classroom. Education that challenges these boundaries that, 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 that are inherent often, you know, to the traditional and dominant educational experience in, in the United States. So, yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, at some point I could talk about the program that I teach too, but. I'll see where you're leading with the, with, with the question. Well, we, we'd like to hear about that because okay. I, I, the program that you're, you know, that you're doing now presumably speaks to what you think is needed now. Yes. And I guess I'd like to hear from everybody uh, on the panel about you know, what, what you think student activism should look like now given the, given the um, circumstances we're in today. So right. you want right. to continue? Yep. So I hesitate to say, you know, to make some statement about what I think student activism should look like. What I'd rather say is, you know, I, I have some thoughts about the types of spaces that I as an educator should create, you know. Um, so um, I'll say a little bit about my program and maybe I'll lead into that a bit. So the program that I, direct, as I mentioned before, originally was called Civil Rights Movement History and Consequences. You know, it was created by um, uh, Duchess Harris, I believe she was the first director of it, a uh, professor, amazing professor at McAllister. You, um, and, um, and originally it was a program that, it was a January term program, it was based in the Twin Cities, you know, so it would start in the Twin Cities, um, and then the students in the program would get on a bus and travel through the South and connect with people who were involved in, you know, the civil rights slash black freedom movement, you know, 50s and 60s, um, you know, just taking advantage of this amazing opportunity to connect with people who were central to one of the most significant social movements of the 20th century. And and getting students and creating space for students, again, to connect their own experiences and lives of as current and emerging social change agents to the experiences and stories of these, of these people they had the privilege of meeting. Um, 
And the power in that experience is, is not only in the interaction with people and the opportunity to, you know, to hear differing perspectives on what happened, um, the opportunity to bring to life the things that you read on a page, you know, through not only interacting with people, but also being physically in places as well, which has its own power. Um, but also the opportunity to create community with people um, and, and um, see your fates and lives as being, being connected. Right? So um, in 2006, actually in 2005, I cold called Hecua. And um, a colleague of mine, you know, we were uh, a guy named Stanley Hatcher, who's now at Metro State. So giving props to Stanley, you know, we were talking about how frustrated we were about how little our students and even our African American students at MCTC knew about the civil rights movement. You know? And um, you know, we had this conversation around the time that Rosa Parks passed away as well. And you know, we were shocked by the fact that we ran into a few students who didn't know who she was. <laughs> Even though the simplest, you know, the most superficial um, accounts of the movement have ruled apart. <laughs> right? So, um, so cold called Hecua. I asked them, oh, would you be interested in doing this civil rights course during the summer? You know, because at MCTC, you know, we don't have JTEM. And Interest was expressed, um, and I ended up uh, teaching the program for the first time in 2006. Uh, over time, you know, for a while, for several years, we stuck to that model where we based it here. You know, we um, spent a week here getting students grounded in theories of social movement, social change, um, yeah, history leading up to the movement, and then spent a week on the bus and kind of wrapped things up here. But in after 2011, I thought that, um, and in part inspired by my experience in Oslo, teaching the Divided States of Europe program, that this program would be so much more powerful if we were actually based in the South. And in some years prior, you know, I'd built some deep relationships with people in Jackson, Mississippi. And, um, and through those relationships, we were able to anchor the program there. Uh, and um, so what's, um, getting back to the question of, I guess, what's needed uh, right now? And what types of spaces are needed right now? Um, spaces are needed where students can feel, hmm, I don't want to say comfortable, but spaces, well, um, where students can grapple collectively with, um, with the, what do I wanna say? I don't wanna say it. Spaces where it's okay, you know, to, to not be, to grapple with the messiness of, of change, to grapple with the messiness of and the complexity of both our past and present, to grapple with the ways that our individual lives and histories connect with the past, spaces where students can build relationships with one another and with others um, in a way that's not just transactional, that's not just about networking, but that's again about like what, what do we all bring to this world? You know, what, what are we passionate about? What is the change we want to see in this world? And how do we all fit in that picture? And how can we create this world together and start that work in the class, but continue that work once our official time together is done. And, um, you know, my experience with Hecua has been, uh, it's, 
it's been a really powerful journey, you know, because I get to see how much easier it is to do that outside of the structure of, uh, a, you know, a higher ed institution. Because I get to contrast it with, you know, my experience within, you know, uh, you know, teaching within a higher ed institution, you know, my community college, which I love, you know, but, you know, there are so many, there are quite a few barriers to doing that really deep type of experiential transformational education, you know, and, um, and, and one has to always hustle and find the cracks and spaces to be able to do that in a really powerful way. Um, so. Well, one of the things that you uh, pointed out was that you know, part of what you saw as a responsibility was the, uh, presenting the history, which is a t typical thing that, I mean, I think we, any educational institution would embrace. But then the rest of your answer seemed to focus on creating the conditions for people right. to, to to, to determine uh, what, what, what they saw as the next steps. And I, and I would assume that that's something that the older folks over here, those of us <laughs> gently, to your please, left. Karen, gently, please, Karen, gently. You know, we, we want to acknowledge that it, you know, it's not the old telling the young how to find the way forward. It's the young finding the way forward and telling the old where they're going. But I, I, I still want. <laughs> of us who remember the 50 years ago to, to, to say a word about it. So John, do you want to, to comment on the, you know, what, what you think might be productive paths yeah. today when yeah. things are... Well, that's, one of the reverberations of the Moral Hall takeover uh, on this campus has been that, that students in the present grappling with contemporary issues have tried to make contact with those of us from earlier generation about uh, how to deal with crises or institutional issues in the present, as if you know, we had a template for doing so. <laughs> and I've always you know, been, been willing, and my, those of us, again, who are survivors of the moral hot day over, I've been willing, again, to talk with them about what, in fact, we did. But I think one of the things that one learns uh, over time is just how uh, precarious and provisional uh, response to a particular, you know, particular historical circumstance may be. So uh, I, my, you know, probably my first response is to s suggest that uh, what's critical here is that you go through the same process that we did of trying to develop a mature historical consciousness, all right, about the human movement through space and time and what uh, the particular particularities of this circumstance that you're in here and now, how do they relate to the particularities of the circumstance that our earlier generations were in, and what usable can you adapt from that? You know, one of the tremendous differences between 1968 and 2018 is the uh, array of technological tools available right, for students of this generation that were not available to us then. And it's a, it's, it's a you know, mind-boggling transformation in some ways. But you know, Alvin Toffler had talked about back in the 70s as the futurist enterprise developed, you know, and future shock uh, what, was the ways in which the, the new technologies um, you know, could become driver, historical drivers in their own right. And that had you know, potential outcomes that simply could not be prophesied from past vantage points. So, you know, just, just simply grappling with the issue about how do you use contemporary technologies in the course of dealing with institutional crises and the push for, for, for social justice and social change on the campus and off the campus. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, the student-led enterprises that are operating now, Black Lives Matter amongst them, have been trying to do so, trying to incorporate some of the, the new technologies. Uh, but I think we're just at a, be at a beginning stage in terms of wrestling with that. And of course, one has to do when, when, when one sees how the news technologies can be grotesquely abused and misabused about the potential dangers there also. But you know, the root of this stuff for me has always been this matter of, of, of developing mature historical consciousness. And that was critical for our generation 
And what, part of what's significant, to, to speak to part of what uh, Helena was saying, is that a significant part of that, our developing historical consciousness took place outside the, the academy because there was no <laughs> discussion of the African-American historical experience predicaments in the academy. So we look, relied very heavily on independent scholars in the African-American community here. Like they worked out of community centers or independent scholars and writers and worked for newspapers and so on and so forth. And we had a, an array of study groups. And we read omnivorously an array of texts that were, had emerged in the, in the early 60s in this country and outside um, that were you know, really critical. I can recall when, uh, you know, when the works of Franz Fanon and were being translated from, from, from French into English between 1964 and 1966. Works like Black Skins, White Masks, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, The Dying Colonialism, and so on. Um, and the works of so many African writers who had dealt with issues of, of, of decolonization and fighting against uh, European imperial powers and trying to make uh, you know, the potential transfer, extrapolate from one to the other. And part, that's part of what, what's happened with black power. One of the motive forces behind the black power movement and key text was precisely that process. Sophie Carmichael's and Charles Hamilton's book, Black Power, uh, was a process of basically changing the paradigm in which we thought about African-American life, which had historically been largely that trying to draw analogies between the African-American experience and European immigrant experiences in this country. Um, what black power did was say that the circumstances, the situations of African Americans in this country are more akin to those of colonized peoples in Asia, Africa, and Latin America than they are to those of European immigrants. And so the immigrant analogy was largely cast aside and replaced by the colonial analogy. And as a consequence, that the, the, it, the theories of practice of liberation right, began to be conceptualized more and more in terms of the strategies of decolonization than they were in terms of immigrant assimilation over a generation. That's just one example. But again, out, this was being done outside the academy. And part of the question we were asking, why can't this be done at this university, which is supposed to be a land-grant university? All right? And this is the point I beat on in some of these talks I've given here recently, because people don't seem to understand this about the origins of public higher education in this country. All right? and the foundation of the land-grant college. There was no public higher education in the United States of America in the middle of the 19th century. Right? Higher education was for the mannered uh, uh, classes, the mercantile classes of the South, the plantation aristocracy uh, uh, in, the, in the deep South, and so forth. The moral acts that created public colleges and universities came out of the, the battle over slavery. And, and Justin Morrill was a uh, was a, a, a Vermont, the son of a Verm illiterate Vermont blacksmith who'd grown up essentially doing manual labor uh, as a child until he and his associate managed to, uh, to make bus have business success and to succeed then on an early version of the stock market. And then with that prosperity, devote himself to, uh, to, to, to public service and to trying to create a new kind of possibilities for education that his father had not had. And the first attempts to create the land-grant colleges came out of legislative battles in the 1850s when James Buchanan, President James Buchanan, who was strongly allied with the slave power and who saw education for the masses and the middle classes as a threat to social order. At any rate, the early attempts at trying to create public land-grant colleges and universities were held down until the Civil War, until the South seceded, until finally, when Lincoln became president, Morrill was able to get the 1862 Morrill Act passed that created land-grant colleges and universities like this. And colleges and universities, which, which Morrill himself said, because he was also an abolitionist, ought to have front and foremost right, the education of the sons and daughters of toil, which is a 19th century euphemism for slaves. All right, the Morrill Acts created public higher education. They also created most of the historically black colleges and universities. At any rate, uh, in terms of, of reimagining the kind of battles that go on on this campus, because some of the battles that students are dealing with now, in part, are the, the, the reverberations of the long battle over whether education in this country, public education, who is, to, who is, it, is it to serve? All right? And whether this institution ought to model itself on private uh, institutions, the Ivy League schools of the East and so forth, and education, again, for the essentially contemporary aristocracies and elites, and whether, in fact, the, the masses of people, the working classes, the middle classes, the underclasses, ought to be its focus and the primary beneficiaries. 
Anyway, that kind of battle, that kind of historical conscience that we were trying to cultivate, and I, again, suggest that students at this point in time need to understand um, the, the history at, at a deep level, you know, far beyond um, you know, dates and places and names and so forth, the deeper structures of history. History may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> Um, and David, especially if following on the um, admonitions that, um, that uh, John has just given us, I mean, I'm sure there's a different riff you may want to give on the on the notion of the land grant here and what it means for for um, activism today on this campus. Absolutely. The <coughs> I wanted to first mention because a lot of points have made, but I think that. Uh, I've never met a, I've been a faculty member in a lot of different institutions, and I've almost always did the same uh, type of work in that regard. But I've never met an Indian student that didn't position his uh, purpose or reason for being at college or university uh, to be not to go back home, to do something to contribute to his community and his people. Uh, and they all have different ideas about that. Many don't understand how they're going to get there and how their education is going to matter to that, but they explain that is the reason why they're there. Uh, the extent to which a university uh, such as this or other institutions can help that student get there is what they're looking for. And, uh, and that has ebbed and flowed in the history of uh, Indian student services and Indian <coughs> studies and other efforts at this campus and other places. And I see just generally a downturn, generally, in the ability of institutions to respond to that overall need. Uh, it is uh, it's somewhat uh, discouraging in a way and uh, to realize that. I remember that when Indian students came into colleges, they would form student councils, clubs, groups to form community. And uh, we did that with our graduate program here. Indian students from all over the country coming together to study something. We all had experiences in Indian education. We were all Indian people. And we were able to get together and to go to graduate school with an ambition of going forward into what was emerging as an Indian education movement. Uh, and we solved a lot of the issues by establishing our own institutions in our own tribes, our own schools, our own colleges, all of that. And I, one of the things I did when I left here, I, I went to work in, at Rosebud, South Dakota to be with a student uh, who also, grad, also came from uh, that same graduate program who, by the way, is the longest serving president of any college in the United States. Just celebrated his 48th year of continuous service as a president of Sintegleshka University. I was there at the time we developed it towards the goal of accreditation. We became the first tribal college to have a bachelor's degree. I remember what, what higher education was like where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, you know, when you're trying to really meet community needs for the higher education program to educate tribal people locally and then to begin to have a more expansive view of that type of education in terms of doing research, of service, and, uh, and, uh, and teaching that connects directly to the community as a dynamic for community development, as a dynamic for uh, improving the basic civil, uh, civic health of the whole community and doing a number of things. It's absolutely thrilling you know, to, to see that going. That's, in a sense, a land-grant mission. The ability of the large institutions such as this, which have a tradition of a land-grant institution that is established in the state of Minnesota at times stands in opposition to tribal communities because of the research they do, because of the service they do, and so on and so forth. Uh, you just take a look at the anthropology department and the professor Jinx here during the time we went through allotment on the White Earth Indian Reservation. He was doing research. Uh, this is in the period my father was uh, a young man doing research by running around white earth, pulling hair out of people's heads, scratching their skin, and doing other types of biometric measures to determine who was a full blood and who was a mixed blood because the law made full bloods incompetent to make their decisions and 
you had some white blood, you would be competent, and too bad you, uh, somebody ripped you off in the first place. Basically, that's it. And the uh, biology lab was used, and so on and so forth. And so it rendered a good service to the state of Minnesota because of all of the white pine that was taken and all of the lands that were opened for settlement in that north. And so how do you counter that? How do you counter that type of, of position of research service of a large institution uh, when it comes to real tribal communities, reservations, and so forth? You do that by, first of all, trying to do it yourself, have your own those kind of functions developed, which occurs in the tribal colleges somewhat, or you develop a way of articulating a relationship with the existing institution, control or regulate the process of doing research. Uh, those are big issues, uh, and but they're directly dependent on the future of home, of community, of tribal interests and so forth, wild rice studies, the modification of the genome around wild rice, issues of natural, uh, of uh, environment and so on and so forth, all directly um, important to which you could develop research partnerships with tribal colleges, with a large institution like this, or a number of other things, you know. But Indian students, as I got to know them, their activism was focused towards that, towards that energy, towards that, and it requires a real education not just passing courses and being qualified to get a degree. I mean, real education. Larry Aiken, a good friend of mine, just passed away, by the way, if any of you know him. Wonderful man. He says, Indian education isn't going to school. It's learning your creation. And what he meant by that is learning everything you can about who you are, about your position in life and your purpose in life. And, uh, and that's a a lifelong uh, occupation and purpose for any human being. And uh, to learn that, it's different than simply passing a course about your tribe or about federal Indian relations and so forth. There's incredible cultural heritage uh, that's available uh, to be learned to, uh, and to develop a hunger for that. Uh, and once you stimulate that, in an institution of higher education, that sort of hunger to learn that, it becomes self-sustaining all your life. And uh, that's what I see has happened here in various places and can happen. I see, it on the, I see it on the decline in a way because there's not enough energy uh, in a way to continue that sometimes. And, um, and yet, you know, it's funny. I've been going to these forums in Rapid City, South Dakota, with a number of really old timers who discuss, well, what, where do we go now? What do we do now with all of this? And we keep on thinking, well, you know, we don't see any of the old timers anymore when we go to conferences, you know? They're all declining in number, and uh, they're just not the same people. Nobody's around anymore. We don't know anybody, and et cetera. And, uh, and they, they, they really don't know anything about the heritage of what, what has been done and what they're doing. One of our people who spoke, he says, you know what, neither did we when we started. <laughs> you know, neither did we. And he says, I have, uh, I remember how we were. We just had a certain confidence that we were going to get things done and learn what we needed to do to get it done. And he says, I have faith that our young people will do the same, he says, if we just won't be so worried about them. And so. Thanks so much. I, I, um, this old timer actually has to go give an honorary degree. And so I, <laughs> I very much regret leaving just at the point where we were about to open up for a, a broader discussion. But I wanted to first make sure that we thank you. And then uh, you're going to have a, an open q and I, I think, for the audience. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, it's always hard to see, but uh, questions? The floor is open. 
how contentious everything was at that time. And I think the divisiveness that we talk about today, I mean, that seems to occur through Twitter and Facebook. Black students took over Morrow Hall. We need to go over there and show support for them. So I think there were about 100 students, 160. I really don't remember who stayed on the first level. And there was some communication. I wasn't among those uh, where that role of the white students on that first level was just for support, not to take over or direct anything. It was just to be there and to be a counter to the students that were uh, gathering outside who showed up at very end. Your, your, your point is very well taken uh, about the uh, conflicting forces. We had, we had both allies and enemies in terms of the takeover. Some of the allies came particularly from the SDS, Students for Democratic Society. And uh, it, it, as soon as the takeover began, opposition uh, on the outside began to form. And indeed, that, that, in that photo, a significant number of those right, were part of the opposition, who qu quickly mounted placards and shouted all kinds of, call, call, of calls, things that in some cases involved a lot of four-letter and abusive words uh, about the about takeover process. SDS members tried to form a barrier in between. Ultimately, we had to barricade the building in order to keep the, some of the forces outside from breaking in and, uh, and, and you know, generating some kind of violent confrontation, which we at all costs wanted to avoid. But again, the, 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 the opposing forces were palpable and powerful at the time. Yeah. How long were you in there? Overnight. We came out the next day, and again, to avoid confrontation, we went through the old tunnel system. You know, you knew or may not know, but there are tunnels under most of the buildings on the old, old side and so forth. They're all closed off. Almost all of them are closed off now. But we went through the tunnels from Morrill Hall down to Ford Hall, and then came out at Ford Hall up the old bridge across to, to, to Kaufman Union. You knew the tunnels when and winter came. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> well, they, yes, yeah, but, they, yeah, but, but uh, yes, that was part of the, the, that context, yeah. Um, thank you all for your, your comments um, and for telling me the story of the Ivy perspective. And um, Dr. Wright, I appreciate that you basically gave us, you know, the syllabus that you created for yourself. Hmm. Well, that would be a fascinating enterprise. Yeah, that would be a fascinating enterprise. That uh, you put in, that you yeah. have added yeah. in yeah. intervening yeah. years that yeah. you can speak yeah. to in this, in this question. Yeah. I mean, my inclination would probably be to try to find a, a set of a very specific current issues to focus on and then to build a syllabus around trying to create the context for understanding, both understanding those particular crises or debates or so on and so forth, and all right, the final process would involve, again, evaluating courses of action to take all right, once the, some kind of holistic study of context and so forth had, had come out of it. And clearly, one would want to incorporate it as why, I mean, instances that, that incorporated as wide a range of cultural communities as possible. 
You know, I wanted to comment, if I might, uh, you had mentioned something about the uh, tension at the time, and sort of, I think you made a reference to today in a way, if, you, if I'm not mistaken. But for, you know, for a number of years, I was Commissioner of Human Rights, and I was doing that work uh, at a time when the uh, Super Bowl and the World Series both affected the Twin Cities in Minnesota. We had the, uh, we had the uh, Super Bowl, which had one of the teams was the Redskins, and we had the World Series with one of the teams having the, uh, the um, uh, uh, Atlanta Braves, yeah. So it got into that, and of course there's protests and everything, and we had uh, the Justice Department shows up because uh, and talks to me with their interest of trying to calm things down and so forth. So nothing bad comes out of all of that. And it was, it's interesting. I, the kind of issues that uh, were faced, that, w that children faced in schools during that period in terms of the hunting and fishing rights, the, the uh, you know, walleye issues and all these other things, incredible racism right under the surface in terms of how Indian children were treated in schools and in the communities and so forth. Uh, and uh, you come to a, a point realizing that, of course, it never goes away. That the act of what you need to do is one of vigilance. Uh, that you have to constantly be present to it all the time. And you can watch now uh, commercials changing with images and so forth reappearing again, a number of things like that. And the hostility in the communities with regard to uh, Indian people and uh, students in schools and so forth is reemerging as well. It occurs in demonstration. It also occurs in the, in the context of life in the community as well. And uh, I think the tension is building. I just heard that there may be a, a, a complaint against the Attorney General that Indian education is discriminatory. Uh, and uh, that's going to heat up things in the, in the rural Minnesota and around Indian communities as well. It's, it's, it's there. And it's coming back again. It's coming back with some force, I think. And, uh, and so I think those challenges are ever more present now because of that emergence and that one needs to, in fact, have similar responses uh, to them. And uh, I think every generation faces with trying to reignite and recreate that response, and it's going to happen anyway. And I think uh, knowing that the past is what it was uh, and realizing it will happen again is an important lesson of history. You know, it really is. And, uh, and so, you know, we can talk about it and, and so forth, but it is still a real act of, uh, of vigilance, learning, and getting people to understand that's happening again, really, you know, in educational settings all over the place. I'd, I'd like to address your question to you about what to add to the syllabus. Um, uh, it would, so I don't have like an idea of like any specific content, but I think it's important to engage, well, to not think that I have to figure out everything myself as the instructor. Yeah. You know, and, and as a, an instructor and as someone, you know, who has some control issues, like that's a constant <laughs> challenge, right? <laughs> right? And so, so I would build in and add to, you know, to what you shared. All right, so who are to actually go off campus and interact and if possible, do some work with organizations that that are grappling with the consequences of the past and working towards how to make the lives of people better now, again, with that sort of historical understanding. So for instance, um, in the course that I teach in Jackson, uh, we not only talk to civil rights 
you know, people, people who were involved in the civil rights movement, you know, decades ago. But we also spend a lot of time talking and interacting and in some instances doing work with organizations that, that, um, that are doing work now. So for instance, um, you know, we connect with organizations in Alabama, you know, that are doing some really powerful environmental justice work and who really clearly connect the work that they're doing now, for instance, around the emergence of, of, of tropical diseases in Alabama and the threats uh, being made or haven't been made towards black property owners because of, of raw sewage on their lands to this history of, of racism in the black belt of Alabama and the, and the, um, the intentional disparities between the infrastructure you know, that was built in white communities and the infrastructure in black communities. And, 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 and hearing, creating those spaces where people who were doing this work, you know, and again, are in that space between past and present, you know, um, you know can talk about it and explain their work in their own words. Um, or the work that we do with a couple of organizations in Jackson with very similar names, um, both with co-op in their names, right, that are doing some really fascinating work around, um, um, around, um, around linking health, linking, um, um, you know, property, ownership of land, linking um, the creation of jobs within communities and, and, and doing some powerful organizing work around uh, how do we, how do we um, really bring out the talents that the people in these communities have how do we discover that? How do we build relationships between one another? You know, how do we, um, you know, do the long-term work around um, around building our sense of agency? You know, to create the communities and and neighborhoods and um, and, and and world that will sustain us and allow us to live in in dignity with one another. You know, so, um, so yeah, I guess the short answer is I'd add in some sort of experiential <laughs> piece to that too. You know, that again, um, that would expose us and, and create that space for us to interact um, with, with, um, with folks and, and kind of contribute to our, you know, this collective building of knowledge about what we need to do in our, in our various contexts, both shared and apart. One thing to follow up on part of what you're suggesting right now, I've been involved the last couple of years in um, the Campus Divided exhibit that the Emeritus Professor Rev. Ellen Prell uh, superintended, which uh, is a an effort to explore the institutional history of this university in ways that it hadn't, hadn't been done before. And which takes us beyond the way in which the university is marketed to entering students from abroad, which is largely a Madison Avenue corporate branding uh, enterprise, all right? Uh, with glossy, all the, the, the glossy brochures and broch and, and the, materials, the online linkages, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the university's dark side and the, uh, well, the, uh, the, those things that uh, were bound to raise controversy, right? uh, that, that, that remains suppressed and out of, out of, uh, out of view. Uh, in, this, in this context, part of the, the campus divided was preceded 
by one of the reverberations from the Moral Hall takeover. Uh, we, we realized when we wanted to have reunions later from African American Action Committee of participants in the Moral Hall takeover, and we started that uh, about 2001, 2002, we had the first major reunion, um, that uh, not only reconstructing the history of the takeover was a problem, but the, the, the place of, of African Americans at the University of Minnesota in general was a problem. There was no such history extant in the existing official university histories. Um, and Flom's more uh, 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 comprehensive and empathetic version went far beyond the original university history. But uh, African Americans were essentially invisible in the early history and weren't addressed at all in the most perfunctory um, and dismissive ways. Anyway, we, we cobbled together uh, a history that was published in a series in the uh, Minnesota Alumni Magazine. Mm -hmm attract the African-American presence on campus again from the, the late uh, 19th century up through the Moral Hall takeover. And a lot was uncovered in that process. Uh, that in part per would pertain to and would be picked up by the Campus Divided exhibit. For instance, uh, Lotus Kaufman, again, who was the longest serving university president, who began from 1920 to 19, uh, 1938, and for whom the student union you know, has been named, um, again, uh, he and, as I mentioned earlier on, he and the lieutenants basically instituted a policy of Jim, Jim Crow practices on campus that hadn't existed prior to his presidency. Right? And uh, 1924, for instance, we turned up, going through back Gopher archives, we turned up images from the 1920 homecoming parade which showed a, a, a Ku Klux Klan float in the uh, uh, homecoming parade for 1924. Right? Images of minstrel shows at uh, at, at, at Scott Hall Theater. Um, anyway, a long a, a, a documents essentially that remained out of sight and out of mind for a very long time. The Campus Divided exhibit probed anti-Semitism, racism, and government surveillance in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s on this campus, and the complicity of administrators, again, from President Kaufman's office on down, again, with the, uh, you know, the, the first stirrings again, basically of the communist witch hunt scare in this country and that demonized both black students protesting against Jim Crow policies and Jewish students um, who uh, uh, were pursuing uh, you know, social justice initiatives on campus and elsewhere um, that were hardly uh, subversive but were being treated as such. At any rate, that exhibit itself was an example of an alternate kind of, pro developing an alternate kinds of institutional history and historical consciousness to what the official message has been. It makes some great sense. Yes. I, when I, uh, I returned to the university as a faculty member, a prof associate professor of Indian studies and chair of the department for a period of time. When I got back, it was very much different than the mission it originally had. But I spent my productive, creative time as a professor studying the university's treatment of American Indians. Mm -hmm. I, I had a wonderful article published out of that and which has to deal a little bit with that anthropology professor I'm talking about because of my personal connection to White Earth and to my father and to that whole thing that happened. Uh, but I'm just, can you imagine, I was an Indian studies professor studying non-Indians at the university uh, in order to make some sense of why I was there in the first place, you know. Uh, it just, it, it was such a um, contradiction or an irony in a way uh, and, and I quit. I gave up a tenured associate position to go work in the real world, to work in Rosebud and to do that. I think I needed to have it no longer mean anything to me because it didn't resonate with that same mission uh, and vision anymore. Uh, the department had a unique vision. In a sense, it was sort of a miniature version of an Indian university in a way. Uh, it had that sense of it, you know. Uh, of community programs, of connections to the community, of focus uh, to the community and so forth. It would, uh, originally got sort of spun off into the Training Center for Community Programs business and so yeah. forth, yeah. and a non-Indian who ran that program. But uh, the, and that mission was still stuck upon the department by the university to have that community engagement and so forth without the resources, the capacity to do that. Yeah. And it kind of, <coughs> basically made an impossible uh, situation for faculty. 
or those who didn't resonate to that because they didn't want to do anything with the community in the first place, and those who did. And so you end up with this crazy fight going on over who's got the more proper role of vision for Indian studies in the university as a perfect setup. Uh, and, uh, and I think it resulted in the, the destruction of a unique possibility of having a tenure granting independent department. That vision is, is kind of fulfilled now in places like, let's say, well, tribal colleges for one thing, because it has that yeah. capacity to do it. But in institutions like Arizona State University that talks about these, it's not trans, trans uh, it's not interdisciplinary studies, but it's where you actually create some new knowledge by putting things together, you know? And you create a whole new field of thinking and studying around an issue. Uh, that's quite thrilling. And uh, I forget the actual term that President Crow uses for that, but I understand this concept of kind of bringing things together from different disciplines and, and, and perspectives to create a sort of a new way of thinking about something, you know? Uh, that, I think, is still very, very possible, and people are trying to do that. It matters to community mm -hmm. to think that way. People in community think that way from a lot of different perspectives, you know? And, uh, and so if you have a, a program or a university that resonates that basic sense of the nature of knowledge as not being stovepipe categorized and so forth into these controllable disciplines by a few individuals uh, to a more expansive sense of knowledge and thinking about issues that matter to society, to community, and so forth, uh, that's a more productive way of thinking of what the university is in the first place, you know? So it is my um, oh. sad task to <laughs> pull this conversation to an end. And I want to thank our panelists, but before we give them a hand, let me just make an announcement. Honor students who are going to dinner with the speakers, please gather in the lobby immediately outside on the east side of the building, which is Canada. Um, thank you all very, very much. And uh, let's give our, our panelists a huge round of applause. Thank you.